G'day guys, welcome back to the Noob Spirit Podcast, Shrek here. If you're new here for the first time, this is the show where we interview spearfishing experts, authorities and characters from around the world. Today we're off to Palapas, Ventana, Baja, Mexico. Tim Hatler and Brock Kennedy, uh, with a massive thank you to Jacob Knightley for helping us get this uh, get this episode recorded. Um, these boys are older gentlemen that know how to have a really good time. They've got a fantastic venue down there and uh, host some absolutely fantastic spearfishing trips. Today's episode is interesting and uh, and funny, and there's a few interesting stories along the way as well. I hope you really enjoy it. Before we get there, a couple of quick shout-outs. Hein Hansen left a review for 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing. Uh, he bought it from Amazon.eu, I think. Anyway, he says, Das Busch Enthalt will Nutzeleche informationen für den Einsteiger ins Harpunen Fischen. Anyway, I don't know how to speak German at all. Anyway, translated, it said the book contains a lot of useful information for the beginner to harpoon fishing, which is presented in a humorous but above all well structured and clear way. The many good pictures make you feel like the next spearfishing trip. Now, Today's interview definitely puts you in the mood for um, a spearfishing trip, that's for sure. And I'm hoping this COVID stuff clears out soon enough so that all of us can get back out travelling and enjoying some of these special spearfishing trips. Before we get into this interview with the Palapas Ventana boys, here is a quick review for the podcast from Guy. Uh, he left this on podchaser.com forward slash Um If you're listening to the uh, podcast anywhere, but you want to leave an interview, that any, uh, a review that anyone can leave, go to podchaser, find Noob Spirit Podcast. Anyway, Guy says, great podcast, Trek is a legend, the podcast is funny and informative, great resource to start your journey safely and effectively. Thanks from Guy in Jersey and the Ch- uh, Channel Islands in the UK. And uh, massive thanks to Guy for that. Let's get into this interview with Brock and Tim. I really enjoyed it. Here we go. Adreno.com.au, the home of recipes, blogs, videos, equipment reviews, and an obnoxiously large range of spearfishing equipment for frothers like you. Not only that, but spearfishing trips and courses, courses and trips that I sometimes get to go on. Check them out at adreno.com.au. It's a Spiro's best friend. Check them out and if you want to buy gear, pump in the code NoobSpiro to save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can use that online, in store. Use the code NoobSpiro, save some cash and support the NoobSpiro podcast. Shop with adreno.com.au. I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, but hoorah! When I say the words neptonics.com, I automatically want to say it. It is solid gear that works. It's the very best of spearing equipment and components from around the planet. Visit neptonics.com. It's solid gear that works. Visit neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off. Support for the Noob Spirit Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped. It was the best in men's below-the-waist grooming champions of the world. Manscaped offer precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped just launched their fourth generation trimmer, the Lawn Mower 4.0, all across Australia and New Zealand. You heard that right, the 4.0. Join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off free worldwide shipping with the code NoobSparrow in one word, NoobSparrow, one word, at manscaped.com. Welcome to the Noob Sparrow podcast. I am joined by Tim Hatler and Brock Kennedy, two of the finest from Baja, uh, the Palapas Ventana boys. How are you, fellas? We're doing good. Great, man. Thanks. Thanks for having us. We're stoked to be on the show. No worries. It was uh, one of your 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 buddies there, Jacob, helped set this thing, whole thing up. So massive thanks to him. Yeah, Jacob's awesome. He knows way more computers than we ever will. So yeah. thank you, Jacob. I also listened to your guys' episode on Spear Factor, so I got a little bit of a, an inkling of what I'm in for on this chat. And um, I also chatted to who I believe is an old buddy of your guys. It's uh, James Sacker recently. Mr. Sacker. Yeah. So, <laughs> Holy smokes. You, wouldn't, you admit hanging out with James Sacker. We love James Sacker, but we usually don't talk about it in public. No, he's, he's, uh, he's a red herring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he... he He's the man. He's done a lot of trips down here with us, and we've taken him some of our best places. Kind of, he likes it off the beaten track, and a lot of fun. That guy. Half half the trip is the fun underwater. The other half is the trouble he gets to on land. 
Yeah, he's a great guy. I, I um, he when I started spearfishing here in Australia, it's probably. 13, 14 years ago now, um, there was a magazine here called Spearfishing Down Under Magazine and James Sacker was like front and centre every magazine, you know. He was a he was a hoe and, and some of the <laughs> some of the trips he did with you guys featured in these magazines and I'm remembering it now as I sort of think back. So it's it's quite visually spectacular where you guys are in the world. Yeah, for sure. Can you describe for everyone where, where you are and, like, let's get an idea of the, the sort of the geography of, uh, of Palapas Ventana. Cool. No problem. Well, Baja is a thousand miles long. It's a skinny peninsula. And all the way near the tip, uh, there's an island on the Sea of Cortez called Saravo Island. It's the southernmost island in the Sea of Cortez. And we chose that for our area because... It's far enough south that it gets a lot of pelagics leaking in there from the Pacific. And it's yep. the skinniest part of the peninsula, too. So you can cross from one side over to the other. And it's a lot like living on an island. Yep. It expands our seasons, our fish species. And we can take other, uh, take advantage of all the, the best weather conditions by crossing back and forth, which is great. So if people don't know Baja at all, think of uh, Cabo San Lucas. That's not us. You can get out of there. And in about two hours, you can be in our little uh, our little niche here called La Ventana, our island. It's Saravo Island. And then crossing over to the Pacific side takes an hour and 20 minutes to our closest spot, three hours to Mag Bay, where our second facility is. And then yeah. uh, we've got more and more spots there. We've been in business for 18 years. So we keep exploring Baja to all these other places that Brock and I like to spearfish. And then we put together trips for our clients. So that's cool. where we're at. All right, cool. So we've got Sea Cortez on one side, we've got Mag Bay on the other. You guys have got a couple of different headquarters there, and it sounds like you've got your logistics and uh, set up for that area and absolutely down pat. I've been um, stalking you guys on Instagram. I've seen some of the species you're pulling out of there, and it looks like just a really alive part of the ocean. Is it, would that be sort of fair? Yeah, Brock, you want to talk about that? Yeah, so we have a lot of species, both sides – Really um, bring in like a lot of wahoo. We get marlins. We get uh, a lot of big pargo on the reefs. Uh, yellowtail in the in the early season. So um, really a lot of lot of opportunities, a lot of different species. Yeah, yeah, I see that. And you get you get big. Uh, bro- is it broomtail groper and there's also you guys you, you guys are a bit spoiled. Is it just striped marlin you get, or do you get more species? No, we get the black marlin also. Um, the striped marlin is more the mag base side in the, in the fall season when the sardine balls are out there and we have a real good shot at uh, marlins coming into those sardines. Okay. So that's really the way we shoot those a lot of times. But we still have the striped marlin and the black marlin on both sides on random drive-bys too. Okay, cool, cool. And then we get to, we do get blue marlin and we get sailfish as well. So we've got a lot of different billfish. If that's on your bucket list, we we do have them all. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, all right, cool. So I, I want you guys to introduce yourselves because I haven't actually done it for you. So I've got Brock Kennedy. Brock, tell us a little bit about yourself and how long you've been involved with Tim for with this uh, with this beast called Palapas Ventana. Yeah, so I've been, uh, been diving since I was eight years old. And I, a lot of tournament diving, a lot of spearfish, um, spearfish tournaments in Northern California. So then I really came into the blue water realm and came down for a tournament here at Palapas in 2005. That was the first tournament I came down for here. And then I spent 10 years as a client coming yeah. here. And then in 2015, I decided to move down here. It's because he didn't pay his bill yeah. and he stayed. <laughs> right. <laughs> Had a big whiskey though on the tab. Yeah. No, but so I um asked him to help me find a house. And then he asked me why I was gonna move here and not work for him. So, I, uh, <laughs> so that was 2015, September of 2015. Wow. Wow. And and Tim yourself, you've been with the operation since the very start. Yeah, this is my uh my brainchild, my dream, my nightmare all wrapped into one. And uh, I'm that dumb guy that built a resort from bare land. So I was just dreaming about Baja every time I came down to visit and finally found a way to stay. So we opened our doors in 2003 and uh, we're still expanding, growing and 
learning new spots and uh, having a blast. Cool, cool. And you're a bit sport. You've uh, you've you've westernized your accommodation. It sounds like like it sounds like you've got a bit of everything. There's internet. You've got an on-site restaurant, bar, gear shops. Are both um, are both of the spots the accommodation blocks that you've got in each location? Are they both pretty? Uh, have they both got sort of all the every you know like the everyday conveniences that we expect in our in our rich Western lifestyles? <laughs> They're really different. So I would say they have all the basics, but on the Steve Cortez side, that's our nucleus. That's uh that's our resort. That's the one you can take your girlfriend to, and she's gonna have a great time. You can be spearfishing all day long, get all bloody, have fun, come back have a mojito your girlfriend got a massage she was in the hot tub she loves you and uh it's got ac it's wonderful on the mag bay side we're gonna call it the uh sportsman's outpost so it's got it's got it's got hot water it's got comfortable accommodations flush toilets showers great spear fishing but we don't have any of the other extra things so if you bring your girlfriend on that one if she doesn't spearfish, she's probably going to kill you. She's not going to be into it. So <laughs> they're very different. Yeah. And uh, we, we kind of have this basically like a, uh, let's call it a stepping stone of adventure. So you can start with one and then we can show you other places that we go and get, get to know the other outposts. And we even do mixed trips. You can start at the nucleus, Sea of Cortez, and then head to Mag Bay and do that or go to one of our other outposts that we have higher up in the Sea of Cortez. But the resort itself is super comfortable and very, like you say, westernized. And uh, the other ones have everything you need, but not as fluffy. Okay. So logistics. So someone's flying in, wants to do a Palapas Ventana trip from internationally. What are the co- what are the logistical arrangements like in terms of flying in from an uh, international destination? Where would they fly into first? E, uh, come in either Mexico City. Yeah. or to San Jose del Cabo. Okay. If you go to Mexico City, you'll take a transfer to La Paz. Yep. And we're only 35 minutes away from the La Paz International Airport. Or if you fly, if your flights are better, because there's more scheduled flights into San Jose del Cabo, then we're two hours away from there. Okay. And we've got it all handled for you. So we've got an AC 12-passenger Toyota high fan. It's got a giant luggage rack for all your sport tubes. I got a driver with your name on his little whiteboard yeah. and I got a cooler full of beer. You just get in the van and either airport, you blast over to here and we meet you when you pull in, get you all set up, give you the weather report and tell you the game plan. It's easy. So all I need to say is like, hola, una cerveza, por favor. And then I'm That's away it. laughing. Maybe baño too. Maybe uh, baño. baño. What's baño? <laughs> Banyo means pit. You got to make a piss stop on the uh, way. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. My Spanish That's is out of touch it. these our, days. Uh, yeah. Our logistics are all set up. That's Brock's job. He's We call him Mr. Matrix. He's always looking at the weather, the boats, the staff, and the logistics to keep you on the fish. But uh, basically, once you get here, it's all handled. Okay, cool. And um, what about – Airport drama. Is there any like, uh, do you have any logistical challenges like with people's gear not coming and stuff like that? No, not very often. I mean, once in a while you get a missed bag, but it's pretty rare. Okay. Right, and cool. in the in the rare case that that does happen to you, we've got rental gear here, both reef and blue water. So we have had a few times when people gear didn't show up day one. Yeah. And by day two, it was here. And on that first dive day, we just Got them in uh, all our gear that we have here for rental, so they didn't miss a miss a beat. Ah, oh, perfect. All right, cool, cool. And uh, and so it's how many days, sort of as a minimum, is a, is a, is a good trip there? Because sometimes you just want to you want to have your travel days separate out, and then you you know five at least five days spearfishing in the middle. I was going to suggest twenty days, but <laughs> <laughs> you can't have enough, can you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Brock? What's the, what's the ideal? Setup? Probably a five day trip, but five days yeah. of diving. Come in on a the night before, spend the night, do the full five days, and leave after that fifth day. Yeah. Or so it's planned six days and have the rest day in the middle. Yeah, nice. 
It starts. You start to want to rest day, like multi day diving on your ears. I find. And what we can do on a rest day is that can be the day that if you're coming during the seasons when uh, we have action on both facilities, then we can do that as the drive day is a perfect rest day and drive from one side to the other and then get back into diving. That's a great way to do it. Yeah. Are there any months of the year where like the fishing is just not, not, not much good? If I had to pick the lowest uh, fishing month. I'd probably say maybe February. And it's, okay. it's not because the fish aren't here. It's just because it's really windy on uh, the Cortez side. So it, it's just blown out a lot. And, and we keep diving for yellowtail, which are fun, but yeah. to come down and plan a trip, it's going to be really hard. And then that same month on the Mag Bay side, the visibility has just dropped. There's good white sea bass. There's good yellowtail. But in the end of the February, the, the vis kind of shits the bed until, until it improves later on in the summer. So don't come in February. How far south do the white sea bass range? Well, we have them in Mag Bay. That's a oh. fish that uh, I'm from California. That was you know the nemesis, the the gray yeah. ghost, and yeah, it was yeah. great. We thought we missed them down here, but guess what? We've got them in Mag Bay, and they they peak in January and early February, right before the viz tanks. Mm. There's a good fishery in Mag Bay, especially in the in the eelgrass out there. But there's a fishery that really hasn't even been uh, really dialed in. We've messed around with it we're getting better at it but i'd say that's one that we still on our own bucket list we want to get good at there's some big white sea bass down here a guy caught a 110 pounder from the shore with a surf wow. rod in one of the areas that we dived last year so they're What's there the, what are the trade winds there um let's see from november to march on the sea of cortez side it's uh northwest then it turns once uh april the wind gets lower and it turns to south southeast and on the pacific side it's mostly northwest all year round the windiest months being april may and june and the main season on the on the mag bay side is when the viz gets really good is september all the way through uh i'd say the end of january that's when it's really good, and we've got lighter winds prevailing against northwest, though. And um, I noticed you guys bought a new Panga not too long ago. Um, how's that boat going? Uh, that boat's awesome. It's uh, our sixth boat. So we have wow. six great boats, and we've got uh, trailers that we can pull them from one side to the next. The evolution of the Pongas has come a long way for us. So the newest boats have double live wells because we do use live bait sometimes okay. we've got killer ladders uh if you're too fat to get in the boat soccer <laughs> are you listening james soccer, <laughs> Brock Kennedy, <laughs> <laughs> myself yeah. uh we've got a high bow which is great for cutting into the waves on the pacific side yeah but a lower stern so if you don't use the ladder you can get over there yeah maximum deck space uh we've got shade on the boat four-stroke motor and wow. they're just there's little workhorses they have flotation them so you can't sink them they're badass little spear fishing sleds also the two of the boats we've done without any drain plug to the outside so that if you can't forget a drain plug overnight or something if you're on a lift board are you trying to say that there would be some operator error here in latin america brock Kennedy? it's possible <laughs> 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 Too many whiskeys, might even, maybe. Might even be on might even my watch. <laughs> There's some remote islands off there too, aren't they? Do you guys get right out and like I, I was looking on the map and I saw like um uh Isla Saralvo, San Benedicto, Socorro. I don't know if you guys are familiar with any of them. They might be too far off. Uh we've done two trips to Socorro Islands. Yeah. So we uh have a liveaboard that we do trips on as well. So not only do we have these uh, camps, but we have a 60 foot boat that sleeps uh, 14, but we keep the maximum load to eight divers. And then we have a 45 foot liveaboard catamaran oh, that we do out. trips on the Sea of Cortez side. Oh, wow. The, the dive boat that sleeps eight, we have done two trips to the Socorros. 
Yeah. And that is just planet Mars. Beautiful. Yeah. Unfortunately, now closed for spearfishing. Oh, but no. I, yeah. So we what? the only trips that we've been able to do. Yeah. Who come up with this? It, it's now a reserve. Unfortunately, it's. You can tell, like, just from look. Just, just based on the hydrography, if you like, um, from looking at it, you know, on Google yeah. Earth, you just think, oh, that looks crazy down there. I actually spearfished it in the 70s. Yeah, wow. With my father, with my dad's friends. From out of Baja or? Out of Cabo, yeah. Wow. It's a long, it's a long, it's a long um, journey by the looks of it. Yeah, it was a good run. I think it was about 30 hours north or 30 hours south. Crazy. And we dove it for like five days. Lots of sharks. Yeah, righto. Okay, cool. Well, um, let's get into your personal journey. So, Brock, you said you started when you were eight. Is that right? Yes, I was 1966. So what, wow, so you just dated yourself too. So. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> this is my so, 33rd annual 30th birthday. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. I might have to start doing that myself. I only just turned the big 4-0. So um, wow. I've got a bit of catching up to do. I don't know if it's going to happen though now. <laughs> but um, so I started in 66 with my yep. father. My dad was a big scuba diver okay. with a buddy, bunch of his buddies at a club that was based on a Lockheed Martin in Sunnyvale. Okay. So they had a big scuba club and I was actually with my father on the boat and he asked me if I wanted to try the tank on today. So okay. I said, sure, why not? And he, I asked him, what should I do? And he said, just breathe normal and follow me. And that was my scuba instruction. And he took me actually 60 meters. Holy moly. Yeah, 60 meter dive back to the surface, asked me what I thought of it. And I said, when can we do that again? That's pretty much the, <laughs> the story for the rest of my life. <laughs> so you were, are you still a, like, um, there's still like, there's, sometimes there seems to be a bit of a tension, like scuba spearing, free dive spearing. Did you start off scuba spearing? Yes, I did. Do you that still do it? No, I don't. Okay. I don't. I probably from when I was maybe 15 years old on, Yeah, I started competing in um, SunCal, which is a Northern California Council for free dive spearfishing. Yeah. And that was pretty much the end of the tank diving for spearfishing. So we'll talk to me a little bit about um, about your experience with that, changing over, um, the stigma around it. I'd love to hear your opinions about it. Feel free to be as controversial as you like. Yeah, when did you go through the big change? I didn't because if I was on a deep reef with a tank on and the spear gun and the fish came by, I'd hammer that thing. Yeah. So yeah. I really haven't changed. I mean, just... <laughs> There's, I mean, I only talk to really freedive spearos on the show and – there's a mad stigma with freedive spearos against scuba spearing. But I know like in, in parts of the US, scuba spearing was massive and there's a big history there. And, it um, still is. Yeah, Florida has a big big spearfishing group that's all tank divers. Yeah, I watched a guy on YouTube a while ago. He had like five shafts and he, he killed five fish in like four minutes. He was at 60-something metres and it was crazy. So to my defence, I dove in Northern California. 18 mm. inches of viz on a really good day. Yeah. So you would tank dive on a 140-foot reef with a flashlight looking in the holes for lingcod. Yeah. And that was how you would spearfish. So it really yeah. wasn't like, you know, <laughs> tons of fish around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How far up North NorCal were you? So I, was in, I grew up in Santa Cruz. Okay. But I dove as far north as um, Willits and up in the Wages Creek area. Up in the Lost Coast area by um, by Shelter Cove, okay, and then all the way south down through really Channel Islands. Wow. I kept a boat in the Channel Islands for twenty years. Okay. Go to Channel Islands every weekend during lobster season, so we were pretty active. And so coming from you know diving temperate waters and then living in down where you are now, um, what's has it? Have you, are you still enjoying spearfishing as much or is it still, you know, because when you go from cold temperate waters down into warm tropical stuff, like I think you can be amazed, but sometimes people lose the appreciation for the diving they used to do. I mean, how, how has your view on spearing changed? <laughs> I think for me, I miss tournaments more than anything else. And I do go up north sometimes and dive a couple of tournaments with all my old buddies. That's yep. kind of something I do to keep that fix going because I do enjoy tournaments competing um yeah. but i think for me the warm water is the bigger fish 
the bigger hunt, um, outsmarting smarter fish. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of what keeps you going. There's still a lot of a fishing appeal to it too. It's still figuring out where they are, where they're going to be. Um, and I tell you what, if I have to put on more than a three mil suit, I think about not going diving now. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you've just had your, a seven mil all the time. You have just had your 33rd, 33rd birthday. So yeah, I am kind of maybe falling yeah. apart a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about you, Tim? When did spearing start for you and, uh, and, and what sort of, uh, what, what's marked your journey as a spear? Uh, I got really into it in, uh, later in life, but I was in, uh, college i spun out for a couple of years and i moved to a spot called catalina island which is in southern california which is an island offshore there and i was stuck in a little camp and with nothing to do and i bought a little inflatable and just started eating up the island getting into free diving spear fishing and hooked on a fish called a yellowtail that was our really our only pelagic we had yellowtail and white sea bass and so got the fever Every spare minute I had getting that little boat and eating up the kelp forest and looking for fish. And after that, I got a job on a dive boat out of San Diego called the Horizon. And that was a pretty famous boat in the spearfishing world. So I got a job as a deckhand. And we did a lot of stuff offshore California to an island called San Clemente Island. And then we started doing trips into Baja. And I just started learning more and more from being around these guys and being the deckhand driving the skiff and just got addicted loved it yeah cool it's it's funny like I, I, um catalina island which you spoke about i mean i read um carlos Isle's book last of the blue water hunters so some yep. of the hunting you're speaking about there just stirs some of my memories with that um were you also hunting the mahi and the as well hey, yeah mahi. on the summer months when we had el nino conditions yep. we would do a lot of paddy hopping so yep. Catalina has a lot of stuff in the channel there, but if you go on the backside of Catalina, we would travel from Catalina to San Clemente Island in small boats yep. and then spend the night at Clemente and we would spear Dorado, yellowtail on the patties, small yellowfin tuna. But yeah, just it's a really fun place for me to cut my teeth and start learning about the pelagics. And then on the horizon, we did trips into Baja. I uh, went to Guadalupe Island as a crew member. Wow. I remember. I went getting, there spearfishing. <laughs> yeah. And I, I worked on these spearfishing trips. And when I was a young uh, deckhand on the boat, we would get time to get in the water and spear, but only when everybody else was out, all the customers would be out. So, hey, Tim, it's your chance. Get in if you want. Well, I'm going to get in, of course. But I had just worked. Uh, driving the skiff and pulling people out of the water that were seeing great white sharks yeah. and uh, get them out, help them with their fish. Then when everybody's on the boat, I would get a chance to go in the water. And of course I had equipment that was pretty, pretty inferior gun that was too small. And I just remember looking at Wahoo and tuna and pissing my pants, thinking about sharks, <laughs> shooting at fish that were way too far away and having the shaft go underneath them and just getting pump to get better at the sport get better gear and learn from these guys yeah. that were on the boat guys like brock kennedy uh who were spearing these big tuna and so uh i i got addicted i just wanted to keep doing the sport and learning and i, I kept pursuing it and eventually found my spot in baja yeah nice so both of you guys have headed south as you got older to the warm water eh? <laughs> yeah and i actually came to baja a lot during my life okay my dad my dad traveled down a lot here a lot so we were down here a lot but brock brock wants to tell you about guadalupe island he did a lot of passenger trips on the boat that i worked on as well so okay. i was telling you about spearfishing guadalupe but i want to hear brock talk about guadalupe because it's ridiculous <laughs> I've yeah, heard so we would big shock stories yeah we, uh, yeah, we spearfish there and every drift would have a blue would have a gray white in with you you would get in the water and He'd be there, but he yeah. wouldn't really be interested and just kind of drift with you. Um, but one time I was coming up for a breath and I had a, something bump into my back and like peg, like kind of hit me pretty hard. And I turned to see what had hit me and I was next to the gills on the gray white and I was in front of his pectoral fin Holy and he was pushing me through the water. 
And so I reached up and grabbed a dorsal and set it up and took it, took the ride. <laughs> <laughs> how long did it how long did it take you for? About 40 seconds till my breath was done. Wow. I was already on my way up. Oh wow. And I left him when I left and he just kept going. Crazy. And, like I was never there. I've seen that a few crazy. I've seen a few different exchanges off there. Why is it such a hub, do you think, for these big great white sharks? I don't know. It must be the the, the sea lion population and the I mean, the supermarkets there, right? That's, mm. it, if you look at where great whites hang out, it's where there's food. Do you have any footage from some of those um, special stories? Those are long before GoPros. Yeah, yeah. It was 19, Dude, 1992. Was that right? It's, it's nice to just, like, not have footage sometimes, but I think, I don't know, there's something about it, like remembering the stories and then seeing the videos. It, it does help you remember. Do you, do you have any regrets you don't have footage of things like that? No, I got them yep. in my head. Yeah, nice. I can still see it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got um, I've got Guadalupe up on the map. Is it um, where whereabouts uh, in relation to the island are you diving? Is it the southern end mostly? So we were inside, inside island, the side close to the coast, mm. and then we would dive north end. Yeah, there was a place called Skips Rock that we had out there. Okay, and then there was spots south. We have the two afueros. We have the two little islands south of the south of the island, and they would dive in between those channels. The blue yeah. water would uh, current would rip through there, and the big fish would come through. Yeah, it's an amazing it's an amazing bit of land. Like just looking at yeah. the map, it's just crazy. And Shrek, we did a three years ago. We did a trip for a special group guy named Dan Silvera, who you should have on your show. Yep. Uh, and his group called Harbor House Life, a guy named Edmund Jin, they did a trip where we went all the way from Ensenada down to Mag Bay. And on okay. that trip, we did stop at Guadalupe, Benitos, uh, Fetus Banks, Mag Bay. But on the way, he, we had some insane experience with Great White Sharks. Yeah, And it is on video. If you look for it called Harbor House Life, spear fishing with great white sharks okay you'll see that we put this guy in an experience where he goes for a ride on the caudal fin of a great white and it's wow. all on film it's ridiculous well wow. people um people have very different reactions to some of those shark ride vids i've seen a few of them and uh they always never fail to get a lot of engagement with the comments yeah, that's what's fun about it <laughs> got a sweet deal for you today guys go to freedivingfamily.com and learn from adam stern and a select team of experts on different disciplines there's frenzel advanced frenzel and hands-free equalization mouthful deep frenzel equalization bifinning essentials these are courses that will give you the one percent that will allow you to improve Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. Again, that's the code SPIRO to get 20% off at freedivingfamily.com. Thanks, Adam and team. Love it. Killfish with precision and power, sending shafts from a stable platform with kill shot spear guns. Made in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin, you're buying American-made dependable spear guns. Get $30 off any kill shot spear gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Nuba. That's $30 off American-made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. It says if they're in the shop or on the phone, they can cash in by saying, crikey, mate, or the Noob Spiro podcast sent me. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com, based in the Florida Keys. Function first, pretty design second. Penetrator's dual action water channeling rail provides more efficient action than similar fins by directing more water flow down the blade. This eliminates wobble, meaning that you get way more bang for your buck, for your energy buck. Visit penetratorfins.com, use the code NoobSpiro to save $25 on every pair, on any pair. That's correct, my friend. Use the code NoobSpiro to save $25 on any set of penetrator blades at penetrator.com. Brock, you've been hunting fish up and down that coastline for it sounds like a long time. Um, what's a fish you still like absolutely just love to to hunt? Wahoo. I think Wahoo and then probably Yellowtail second. With Wahoo, you, you, you've got a, a crew of guys and they're as equally keen as you are to go and hunt them. Uh, assuming it's a good time of year to hunt them, 
uh, maybe let's say the Mag Bay side, um, how do you sort of advise them to go about shooting their first Wahoo? So don't take an early shot. Be patient. And really very patience is the whole thing. If you react to them, they will, they will stay away. If you if you react to something they're interested in, like your flasher, mm. so you go for your flasher as they come in, they almost will try to race you to that, yeah. Because now you're not competition, or now you are competition. You're not a threat, okay. and so and also, if there's one coming, there's typically more following. Okay. So if you go for the lead one, and he starts to veer away, don't react to that because the other ones are going to spook with him. So if you let him go, he's going to stay straight. The other one's following behind, and you get another shot as you get deeper. Okay. So really, that's the patience is the thing. All right. And are you guys using throw flashes much, or are you just uh... – Yeah, we use a throw flasher. We also use hang flashers too. The okay. throw flashers seem to be more effective on the Sia Cortez side and not so much the hang flasher. Okay. But both are very effective on the Magdalena side on Pacific. All right, cool. And uh, best times of year for Oahu down there? So in our area, in the Circates side, really coming to the end of May, running through mid-August, okay. and then picking up again mid-October through November for kind of like the return of the big guys. Yeah. Then on the Mag Bay side, we usually run September, really through the middle of January, and there's opportunities for them for sure. Some people say Wahoo can be really stupid fish. Um, how would you respond to that? Yes, they can be. But they can also be very smart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's part of reading what the fish is doing, right? Yeah. You can tell when they're dumb because they're really they're not afraid of you. They're they're not passing by, they're almost swimming to you. And yeah. they're almost not and they'll be crossing instead of doing one direction. So you read how the fish are reacting and that's how you react to them. Anecdotally, I've also heard that like when you have a fair amount of rain in the days sort of following those big rain squalls, you can get a lot of uh, wahoo. Um, any, uh, how do you, what do you think about that? I think that we see the pattern where we see a big blow, like a couple of days of pretty big wind and then a settle down day. And then that seems to be a day we find wahoo coming up. So weather would be a factor for sure. Okay, cool. I think it's because they stay deep. I think the bait goes deep when the weather's heavy. Yep. And the bait goes deep, so the big fish stay deep, and they can't see their bait to eat because they're not being given away by the by the sun. Mm. And so as the sun clears and the weather clears, the, the bait come high and the other fish come high too. All right, what's your what's been your most uh, memorable wahoo, Brock? And then I might ask Tim for his. Wow, my most memorable wahoo. Okay, I would say the one at Guadalupe. Okay, I was at Guadalupe, and I was actually talking to my friend. I had my my mouth on the water and we were talking about not seeing anything for a little while. And I put my face back in the water and it was almost like I was surfing on top of this Wahoo. Um, <laughs> he was sitting right underneath my fins. Turned out to be 115 pounds. Wow. But uh, I was just not paying attention. and He was underneath me like, Hey, what are you guys doing? Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> and uh, Tim. Yeah, buddy. Your, have you shot a Wahoo that you still froth about? Yeah, I'm pretty stoked on shooting Wahoo. I love that they seem to appear from nowhere. You mm. never see them coming. Even big ones, they just seem to all of a sudden appear, which I love. Yep. Uh, I had a day where, like Brock was talking about, we get that second coming, the witching hour of Wahoo, which is usually in November when the, the big ones come. Yep. And we had some conditions on the northern end of Saralva where the fish were so thick, you were trying to look through the 50 pounders to find bigger fish. And on one drift, I shot four Wahoo. And I was actually using Wahoo that I had shot on my flow line as a flasher to attract more Wahoo. Wow. So it's a good flasher. And I got one that was uh, 88 pounds. That's my personal best. But they are just phenomenal fish, super fun. The biggest we've ever taken here at uh, Palapas Vedana is Pete Coriel shot one probably about three years ago, and it was 112. And I saw that. It looked, looked like a marlin, just a 
pig of a fish. I saw that on your Instagram. It's an absolute beast. Yeah. For, yeah, um, beautiful. For I never for, get tired of those fish. Yeah, it's a monster. That's a monster fish. You guys aren't just – you don't just have wahoo and marlin, though. We've talked about it. I mean, you get rooster fish, which uh, have got a, a large trophy appeal. Um, I've heard negative things mostly about the eating quality. So um, do you guys target sure. them much? Yeah. Yeah, if uh, people are bad-mouthing rooster fish, I invite them to come down and, and eat a dish called albonigas, which is made by our chef, Mari Lucero. Okay. And it's basically a meatball soup made out of rooster fish, which Ooh. everyone in our town, if you want to have albonigas, the only fish they want to use is uh, rooster fish. It's a kind of fish that if you slap a steak on the grill – You'd be disappointed, but if you know how to cook it, it can be really good. It's not endangered. It's the kind of thing that a lot of people have a stigma about keeping one, uh, and and they say that they taste terrible and you can't eat them, but it's a gringo thing. Don't believe the hype. We don't keep a lot of them, but when we do get a good one, we turn it on Bonigas, and we're stoked to put you on a trophy rooster. We've set the world record for rooster fish here twice. Wow. I got it for the 73.8 pound rooster. And then it was broken by Matt Davidson from uh, blue tuna spearfishing in Ventura, California. His was, I believe 78 pounds. Wow. So we've set the world record here twice. That's a big fish that, that, that yeah. are fo- hard fighting fish too. I hear super hard fighting fish and very visual. They've got that comb that comes up in the air. They pull like crazy. And if you're into fish printing, beautiful to, print that comb and oh wow position. yeah a that lot of look, fun that would look awesome printed out as a guy talking yeah. for sure yeah we get a lot of hawaiian guests here and they they print that fish it's beautiful yeah, that's right. really nice um tuna tuna you guys get yellowfin there what are uh, you get what else do you get we do we get yellowfin tuna we don't get bluefin they're up yeah. in uh southern california but we get yellowfin on both sides Yep. Sea of Cortez, we do get them not as big. Our biggest here in the Cortez has been 180 pounds. Oh, respectable fish. But uh, on the Pacific side, it's a different story. And I'll let Brock talk about that because we've got an area that we're targeting on our Mag Bay liveaboards and we're starting to pull out some cows. So, oh, wow. yeah, we pulled a, pulled a 320 and a 240 on the same day. And wow. then lost gear, lost everybody, a guy's gear is, and what he said was a big fish, but lost all the gear. Um, but the 320 was, we had chummed from about three o'clock in the morning and just kept chum line going off the stern of our liverboard. And then daybreak, we got the guys in the water. And I'd say within the first 20 minutes, we had that first big fish on that 320. Yeah, wow. And uh, that's a place we also, we had another like a 264 there, right? Exactly. Yeah. Some big fish. This is a, a long range spot for guys coming down from San Diego, but for us, it's short range. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah I'm looking at that. Like, uh, again, I've still got my sort of my Google earth um, map open here and I'm just looking, there's like a shelf and then off the shelf, maybe you're talking like, I'm saying 50 kilometers off Mag Bay, you've probably got that shelf that drops down and then out further another 50 K there's all sorts of sea mounts and crazy stuff going on. Right, so that's some of our blue water drifts out there. We have a yeah. couple of drifts north of the Magdalena Island. Yeah. Then we have also that other spot south of Margarita. Mm-hmm. And that area is all called the it's all called the Ridge, and it's a big, long range fishing area. Yeah. But, right. Uh, on the on the Liverboard, we actually stay offshore, so we drift on a sea anchor and yep. just stay offshore to get everybody diving all day long in those spots. And have you got tenders off the off the Liverboard or? Ha- yeah. How- Yep. Okay. So we run a ponga. We have a 23 foot ponga that tows behind for the whole trip. And then also an inflatable, about a 14 foot inflatable. Uh, And they're manned the whole time. People are in the water. Our mothership usually anchors just off the high spot. And then we'll mark the high spot with a marker buoy. And then we just start doing cycles, just running people up and down upstream and go upstream and go. Jeepers, you guys are spoiled. That bit of the world looks awesome. Just just looking at the maps (laughs) making me go, oh, I want to go. (laughs) <laughs> that's the spirit yeah so the um grope is something that intrigues me like you guys have got a couple of species here you got uh golf and there's uh broomtail and there's a few others um walk me through sort of um how and when you guys encounter them and and some good hunting techniques 
Okay, well, let's start with the Cortez. We uh, we have our, our daily driver grouper. It's called the Leopard Grouper Cabria, and we did set the world record for that here. It doesn't get huge. I think the world record's 35 pounds, but it's a great eating fish. It's uh, yeah. prime eating. It's everybody's favorite fish. Those mm. are going to peak here. In, uh, all they're, they're around year-round, but the peak is going to be April, May, when the sardines are really... Uh, coming in here on the Cortez side and they get distracted. They come out of their holes because they're eating. Yeah. Uh, on our live aboard trips that we do in the sea of Cortez, we do have a catamaran that we cruise around in comfort into the upper islands. It's got great reef spear fishing. Mm. We do have Gulf grouper and we did get a one thirty. That was a uh, shot by a guest from Qatar and another one twenty that was shot by some guy named uh, Pete Coriello a new spear fisherman, a beginner. And, <laughs> and I a, shot that. I shot the one that was 89 pounds too. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. so all those right. are all great fish on the Sea of Cortez, but our main grouper fishery is going to be on the Pacific side. So back to the Mag Bay, that's going to be September all the way through January. And that's where the broom tails and the uh, Gulf grouper are. And they're in force. They're everywhere from, 45 feet to 95 feet yeah uh and fish up to 130 pounds mm. but there's a lot of fish it's funny because they ought to, a lot of times they're on structure that brock and i will tell people we got the flag we put a marker buoy on a spot so it's really clear exactly where someone needs to dive instead of hey this is a general area no this is exactly where i want you to do a dive when you dive, you're going to go down and you're going to see a, a structure that's only five inches tall, a ledge of a rock. You're going to come up and you're going to tell me, this place sucks. There's no structure. I want to get out of here. <laughs> and we tell you, take another dive. This area doesn't have a lot of structure. Big fish hang around here. Second dive, client goes back down and they're going to get hung up on a big grouper because they hang out on these little structures. But if we don't give that speech. People want to leave right off the bat and uh, you got to have a little patience, but there's big fish on this little bitty structure. It's also nice because the fish don't get as hung up. And we tell the people, put the brakes on as soon as you shoot, get it to lift off 15 feet off the reef. And, and then they kind of give up. But those, but those first 10 feet when you're kicking up or it's, it gets pretty real. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Even with <laughs> even with like thirty pound grouper, like there's a lot of work. If it's like it's hard to they hard. They seem to be a hard fish to stone as well. Like uh, I actually did stone the one I got. I hit him in the side of the head, and he yeah. rolled over upside down and flew to the surface. I was so, like, wow. It's just so much bone structure. You've got to have a bit of faith in your right. spear gun that you're powered up enough if you shoot him in the head. Well, we had to we had to cut my tip out. Actually, yeah. you cook it out. The guys <laughs> took the fish head home and they cooked the fish head and brought my tip back the next day. Yeah, if you're gonna do like, um, if you're gonna do like, put a skull back together, one of those big grope would be pretty fantastic, I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be cool. Shrek, my dude. You're killing it on the Noob Spiro podcast. Every guest you get on frosts on the spearing life and the actionable info is off the chain. Over here at Spearing Magazine HQ, it's the same, buddy. So many noobers are submitting their adventures, lessons learned, and pictures here at spearingmagazine.com. Just wanted to say that uh, noobers can get an international subscription here at spearingmagazine.com. They can also check out our In the Face Apparel or getting a subscription to the world's greatest spearing magazine. Check it out at spearingmagazine.com. Shrek, thanks. Love what you're doing. Jeremy out. The struggle is real sometimes to find a spearing buddy. Imagine if there was an app that could connect you with other people that also were looking for a spearing buddy. Well, good news. It's like a Tinder for fishing. We've got the Fishing Trips app available on iOS or Android. Download the Fishing Trips app. Use the code Noob Spiro in there as our referrer and find yourself a buddy, dive safer, and get your mates onto it too with the Fishing Trips app. 
Great news, guys. Adam Stern has made his freedivingfamily.com courses available at a discount for the new Spiro community. If you get on freedivingfamily.com, use the code Spiro, you'll get 20% off any course. There's a bunch of sick courses on there. There's an equalizing uh, stage one. There's an equalizing advanced techniques um, video there. They're two of my absolute favorites. If you have any problems with equalizing, go to freedivingfamily.com. Get Adam's course and use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. What about culture and stuff down there, guys? You you mentioned like one of those dishes that you've sort of borrowed from uh, from the people down there with the rooster fish and stuff. What else sort of has made its way into the resort and sort of the way you guys do things? Well, you know, eating the fish is half the fun of a trip, so – we absolutely love getting our guests involved in eating their catch. Uh, we love to eat whole fish. So you take a pargo. There's a great way to fillet it out so it splits in two. It lays flat. And they call it sarandeado. Okay. It's, it's coated in all that low-fattening stuff, the butter, the mayonnaise, <laughs> yeah. the hot sauce, <laughs> and grilled up. It's great. Another one, we stuff it. They wrap it in aluminum foil. Uh, Mari, Yuli, Ulysses, all our great cooks. They stuff it with uh, vegetables, uh, cheese, even pieces of ham, peppers. Unbelievable eating the whole fish. And then our, our chefs are getting used to what uh, Spiro's these days like. So they're doing sashimi. They're doing sushi. And then also the Mexican ceviche, which is raw fish just cooked in lime. Mm-hmm. unbelievable so we've got coconut fish that mari's favorite way to cook is it with a, a nice dorado battered with coconut flakes so Ooh. every night that's that's half the fun yeah 100 percent. i love it the the like the the trip is awesome and the fun you have at hunting and doing all the stuff but I, I also like the other part where you get back to camp and you um you know you celebrate that fish by just eating it <laughs> yeah it's, that's that's the part we like the best so what's your guys diet like are you seafood a couple of days a week three days a week because sometimes you do get sick of it I've, I've i've um i've i've eaten seafood for probably more than a week straight and you do start to go ah you know i'd love some kfc <laughs> i'll tell you what man there's nothing better than carnitas yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and when it's windy, like right now it's in the uh, Sea Cortez side, it's getting windy. So yep. it's a good time for us to shift over. Yep. And uh, but in the summer we eat a lot of fish. Yep. But uh the, you know, our, our chefs are even we're gonna do a little cookbook that's in the in the in the mix to do a little recipe book for people, but the dishes they're making are unreal. You should have submitted some. I just published it. Well, I'm in the process of publishing a cookbook right now. Um, cool. The community got behind it. I raised uh, twenty six thousand dollars or something. We sold um, a whole bunch of them, so they're shipping in March. But um, it's cool wow. seeing seeing what Spiros are doing with fish in their part of the world, and that's kind of why I was curious about the the influence it's had on the food that you guys are eating down there. So it's cool that you you're getting a bit of everything. Yeah, absolutely. We got a lot of species. And our, our, our cooks think it's funny that we're raving about stuff that they've just been making for their whole life for their family and that it's so easy for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What about scary stuff? Um, you guys are pretty isolated down there. You don't have um, – what, what in, in the event of an emergency, what's kind of um, – I mean, tell me a story of something scary that's happened to each of you, but then I'd love to hear how you guys deal with emergencies down there. Sure. Well, one of the things is uh, the farther – we get away from camp. The more we tell people is don't do something dumb. So think about your limits, but with really clear water and uh, tempting fish, I remember happened to be a Russian group. And we had a guy that was a 60 foot diver diving at Thetis bank with top to bottom visibility of a hundred feet. There's a pinnacle there at 95. He could see the fish. So the 60 foot diver, Dives down to 60, sees a fish in 80, spear fishes a little farther down, takes a long shot, plugs a big yellow tail that goes down to 95 and wraps up in palm kill. So now 60 foot diver is at 90 feet with his feet on the reef, trying to pull a fish out of palm kill and uh, eventually lets go. 
and on his way up has shallow water blackout. So we're offshore and we've got to basically regroup, get him together, get him in the boat, blow air on his face, check for breathing. We get lucky. He comes back to and we have to kick him out of the water for the day and yeah. go back to the rules of know your limits um, and stay with your buddy because it's too tempting in that blue water. So we try to tell people as much as possible that it's just a fish. Yeah. It's not worth your life. The people that do get into trouble are the ones that get fish hung up and they mm. start doing repetitive dives over and over and over deeper than they should be trying to get a pargo out of a cave, a grouper when they shot it with a bungee and it stretched out and went into a hole or a yelltail wrapped up in kelp. But luckily, other than a few stories like that, we've been pretty good. We do have oxygen nearby. We're never farther away than usually a two to three hour ponga ride back to medical care yeah um so even though it feels really remote we've got logistics set up with with cars and uh being able to get people to help pretty fast and also i know the trips that we guide um we're doing deep dives or we may shoot a fish deep we always bring scuba with us and it's on this liveaboard and we tell people if you shoot something deep don't feel obligated to retrieve it let us know and guide up with the tank on and go down and retrieve that fish for you. So yeah, that's well. another thing to keep people from putting their limits when they really don't have to. Yeah, nice. Brock, have you ever scared the shit out of yourself and done something a bit silly? Uh, I don't know. Probably. <laughs> um, I can't think of really a time that, other than I got tangled in cable one time with a white sea bass and tangled through the kelp and me and the cable. And I thought to myself, this is probably how it ends. And then I, for some reason, I kind of relaxed and let things happen the way they're going to happen. And the cable untangled and I got out. And so um, that's one thing. And I also had a Pargo come out and knock my mask off one time with the spear in him. The unicorn him, came straight out, knocked my mask off, tangled me in, in all the shooting line, and then pulled my arm back into the hole. Fire. So my mask was off and my arm back in a hole. And I just found my mask. There it is. I'll put it on. Cleared it. Looked at my hand. Got my hand out of the tangle. Then got my neck out. And then went to the surface. And then regrouped and came down and got the fish out. But um, other than that, we had just a couple of blackouts, like Tim said, on trips. But we really watch it pretty close. We have um, really attentive captains, typically going to live aboard. The guide is in the boat with the captain. So you have two eyes, two sets of eyes on you all the time. We're always counting buoys, looking for snorkels on the surface, mm. kind of a repetition and uh, going by and throwing sardines. And that kind of keeps you in the pattern of keeping track of your divers and what they're doing. And that's a, just the kind of way we run the trips. Um, real, real hard question maybe for you guys. Um, does guiding all the time erode some of the joy you have in your own spearfishing? <laughs> I'd, say, I'd say it makes you just want to have – personal days there's a lot of joy in putting other people on fish which is kind of the next level of spear fishing and we do a lot of teaching here we tell people that it's a great place to get experience and getting in the water without a gun with a flasher and a bag of chum and having somebody connect on a fish that's their personal best is incredibly rewarding mm. um, but also getting a few days off and getting in a ponga me and brock to do 180 miles in a 23 foot boat for four days is pretty great so you got to <laughs> return to the you got to return to the source yeah yep. you're back to the basics Love i it. think too like tim said i enjoy giving some of my knowledge out guys yep. will tell me what they did and i'll be like yeah but try this yep. and try this action and then I have people come back at the end of the day and say i shot it because of what you told me Yep. And so that kind of lets the lets it go on, right? Yeah. Because yeah. we had mentors. Yeah. We had 100%. mentors when we were growing up. And 100%. so you're kind of giving back. Yeah. Um, for you guys, um, I'd love to describe I'd love for you to describe the characteristics of a, of a of an ideal like any like any like I think in spearfishing, like 
you get dicks and you get good people, you know. Um, I'd love for you to <laughs> I'd love for you to describe the attributes <laughs> of people that are great customers and great people to go diving with. Well, I think people that come here with an agenda that they're going to spearfish. They're not coming for that one big trophy fish because that happens. Um, but you're coming to an area where it's likely to happen, but you have to come with the realization that I'm coming for target time. I'm coming for trigger time. I'm coming to enjoy myself in the water. I'm coming because I love the water and I love to hunt different places. I think that's really the ideal attitude to come diving anywhere you go. Anything to add to that, Tim? Uh, I'm going to say that some of our best divers are the mellowest divers. They've already seen and done a lot of stuff and they're looking for a certain fish and they're just putting time in the water until it happens. And the other people that are super rewarding to guide are new spear fishermen. Nibes. And and they're looking for anything to get uh, more experience. They listen to what you say. They appreciate what we're doing. And they're just like that young kid that's fired up with tons of engineering that energy and they want to do one more drift, one more chance. And uh, that's super rewarding as well. Love having guys like that. Cool. We won't even worry about talking about dicks. They don't, <laughs> <laughs> they don't have the self-awareness to friggin' pay attention I think, anyway. I think, we so. both said, I think we both said what that would be in yeah. telling you what the real person would be. Yeah, exactly. Come here. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's and another that's, show. That's that's the next show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you gotta ask the real questions too though, you know. Um what about what about funny shit guys? Like you must have seen and heard and done some funny stuff over the years. I'd love to hear some of your funniest stories. I got one I got a, a client who uh just zero patience loves the idea of him with this big uh Dorado but has no patience. He's uh, he got a nice Wahoo, but he really wants a Dorado. He's going out and we tell him, you know what? Get live bait. Okay. Our captains are going to net bait for you. Go out to the fads. Cause we put out here at Survival Island about 15 fads every year, a buoys with palm fronds and silver beer cans on them. They attract a lot of pelagics. Hit the buoys with bait, even bring a rod and reel. Try to hook a Dorado because other Dorado are attracted to a Dorado on a hook. Yep. Once you get one, the captain will keep it on, get in the water, and spear one of the big bull Dorados that are around the other one. Sounds like a good plan. Again, the guy has no patience. Does everything I said except for the fact when he gets in the water, he has no patience to wait for a good shot on the Dorado that are following the one on the hook. So he just shoots the one already on the hook. <laughs> so whatever, if that's, that's your thing. Okay, there it is. Captain brings it up and it's got a hook and a spear in it. Okay. That's like um, the fish. Of course, this, the client. This is like a negative form of flight. This is like, you know, behind the wire and like trophy hunting and stuff. This is <laughs> where right. you basically walk out onto someone's farm and shoot a captive animal. This is right. like spearfishing's version of it. Yeah, I exactly. I can't, ex I can't explain it. Oh, well. Whatever. Well. So I have almost the same story, but I was down here as a client <laughs> Yeah. when I was probably 2008 or something. But a friend of mine came down with me, and we were on Mag Bay side, and we got in a big school of Dorado, mm. and, the, and the captain was hand fishing also with a hand line. So we all jump in. And my buddy shoots this Dorado. He goes, he goes, that was the easiest Dorado ever. It was swimming right at me. <laughs> so it turns out the captain had it <laughs> on a line. <laughs> <laughs> at least that's what he didn't do it on purpose. So he had no idea. Yeah. He's like, that was the easiest Dorado I've ever shot. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Jeebus, the problem with those Mahi is like, like I think the first few I shot, like they just leap out of the water and your lines get crossed over and oh, they just yeah. go absolutely batshit crazy. Yeah, they're a fun fish. Do you shoot them in the head now or? I shoot them where I can. Yeah, right. -o. Just get them in the bag. <laughs> the other thing, you know, we'll tell people, hey, new spearfishermen, when you're, you're shooting dry, a lot of times you see them on the surface. The surface shot is the hardest shot to actually mm. connect with in spearfishing. Yeah. Don't do anything pretty. Don't try to make a dive. Just blow out your air at least. Get yep. one foot underwater. Get your arm 
and your gun underwater so it's not subject to all the the surface waves yep. before you shoot everybody misses from the surface because <laughs> you're sitting on the waves <laughs> yeah that's good i love it you yeah, just the exhale dive eh? it's a simple thing too. yeah you can do a single leg duck dive just enough to get down a bit I just love a functional and simple spear gun that I can trust when I pull the trigger. Killshot spear guns utilize the finest of kiln-dried Burmese teak. Killshot spear guns also combine American-made parts and fine craftsmanship to bring you accurate, reliable, and simple spear guns that you can trust fish after fish. Get $30 off any Killshot spear gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Uber. That's $30 off American-made performance. Spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. I'm really sorry for this terrible accent. Brought to you by Ed Martin at killshotspearguns.com. Friends, check out oldmanblue.com.au. It's quality made dive gear right there in the Western Australia by a really cool team. The Old Man Blue team are a very experienced bunch of frothing spiros that live the life and have done so for a number of years. Check it out at oldmanblue.com.au. Sometimes with weather and commitments, it's a long time between drinks in your spearfishing journey. If you want a dry training program that can keep you in some kind of shape for spearfishing, check out Ted Hardy's 28 day freediving transformation at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. That's noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. Now the 28 day freediving transformation is just a practical dry training plan that Ted Hardy will walk you through and it will help you get results even if you can't get wet at the moment. Check it out at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. So dive bag down there, gentlemen. Um, year round, are you using the same suit? Are you in a three mil year round? or No, we're probably, this time of year, if you're in the water, you're three mil. You might even want a five mil. Okay. Um, it's pretty cool. Coming into May, you're probably dropping into your three mils. Starting to wear three mils because you still have a thermocline. And they're rolling into July, August. You're in a, in a rash guard top and shorts and your booties. So your feet don't chafe okay. the fins. So, and then coming back through into September, kind of going back into three mil, three mil top, pants, no pants. And then by December, you're back in your three mils again. On mm-hmm. the Mag Bay side, you can start out in three mils over there in the September part of the season. Mm-hmm. But as you get into December, you're going into a five mil also. I still okay. have a, so I still go just a five mil top and three mil pants because I don't like the five mil everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is weird. Like sometimes with the five mil suits too, you only put them on for part of the year, and every time you dust it off again when when you know summer's finished, you like it just feel they. I know I'm getting older and fatter as well, but yeah. the, the suits just like they feel more tight again and in all the wrong yeah. places. Yeah, they shrink. You're not getting fatter; they're just shrinking. Well, I'm, I am getting fatter as well. But. <laughs> right, so it's a double whammy then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then, I started out with my dad in 1966. He bought neoprene, a roll of neoprene, mm. seven millimeter neoprene, and had me measured for a suit at a tailor and then chalked it out on the neoprene and cut that out and glued it together. And that was my first wetsuit. Oh, wow. We put it on with talcum powder. And that was what we... Like that was the top notch stuff. No zippers, nothing, uh, hooded top, and Farmer John pants. At least it would have fit. Like, um, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, far out. Some of the old wetsuits, like, they might have been thick and all the rest of it, but they, if, you know, like, they're only as effective as the volume of water that the inside of the suit kind of holds close exactly. to your body. So, so if they fit well, it's a good suit. 100%. You get one layer of water in the first time you get in. And that warms up, and then you, yeah. then you pee once in a while, and then it keeps it warm inside too. <laughs> Apparently, that's a myth. I, I hear this thing that if you piss in your suit, it gives you a momentary, you know, good feeling like ah, I'm warm again. And then apparently, it draws heat away from your body, and you, it actually forces you to cool cool down. Faster. Right, so you just have to pee more often. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking keep about going for that momentary pleasure. Just I'm keep thinking seeking of, that. I'm really seriously thinking about sewing a pissette into every one of my wetsuits. No, no you, you guys ever considered it? No. Nah? No. No way. There's only oh. only two kinds of people in the world: those that pee in their wetsuit and those that lie about it. 
<laughs> well, I want to pair my wetsuit. I just don't want to have to pull it down or anything like that, and I don't want my wetsuit to stink. Like, uh, well, that's probably a hard thing to do because if I ever find that guy pees on my wetsuit, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> the Europeans have got it sorted, I reckon, with their with their pissettes. Um, what about for guys traveling there um, year-round for whatever they're doing, um, what sort of – do you have guys – like bringing too much gear, obviously flights are quite restrictive with how much baggage you're allowed to bring. Um, what's what do you do, do guys ask you for a list of what they should bring? Sure, we've got a list that tells them what they need to bring for the reef, blue water, and then don't bring weights, please. If you want to leave uh, even floats and float lines at home, we've got them. Okay. If you want to rent guns, we've we've got reef guns and we've got blue water guns as well. But most guys want to bring their own guns and uh, sometimes use our floats and float lines. But definitely, please don't fly with weights. We got all that stuff. All right, cool, cool. All right, guys, let's head on out with a faster pace round of questions. Are you ready for it? Sure. The Jeff, like a, Jeffrey it's like a game show. Yeah. Okay, my this, hands on the buzzer. This is this is Shrek's action part of the show. So you guys are going to be on point. You ready? Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go with Brock first. What is the single best piece of advice you've ever been given for spearfishing? The best what? Single best piece <laughs> of advice you've ever best been given. Best piece of advice. Yeah. Stay patient. Tim, who has been the most influential person in your spearfishing and why? Uh, Pucko, Ian Puckridge. Oh, wow. Came here and blew our mind. We didn't know what flashers were. The guy came, he had... 10 flashers on his belt, throwing them around during the World Cup. We had to make a rule that said you can't shoot fish on Pucko's flashers. <laughs> <laughs> it just rocked our world. Yep, love it. Brock, if you had to start all over again, what would you do differently? Nothing, nothing. I would do the same thing I did because it got me here, and I like I like what I'm doing. So. All right, cool. Yeah. Tim, during your however many years spearfishing, I haven't even asked, by the way, what is the single biggest lesson you've learned? Uh, I'd say know your limits and uh, understand what it is when you feel like you're hungry for air and what your body is going through. Yep. Don't do something stupid, especially when it can ruin everyone else's trip. And I, I watch that in our clients. So know your limits. All right, cool. Last question each. Brock. What current challenges do you face in your spearfishing and how are you overcoming them? The current challenges is probably getting older. Um, I still have a lot of energy in the water with a few more aches and pains, but I just don't give up. You got to just keep going. Yeah, nice. yeah. Tim, uh, last question. Could you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you in one sentence? One sentence. Uh, I'm going to say keeping it pure. To describe it, I'd say it's a Zen sport. Quiet, 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 and then pandemonium. Just everything <laughs> breaks free and it changes. So you've got the the Zen time and the chaos all mixed into one. Awesome. Yeah, nice. Some guys, thank you, Tim Brock. I've had an absolute pleasure. Um, people can check out your Instagram at palapas ventana underscore fish if you want to check out any of the links or videos or whatever we've discussed today guys come to noobspero.com forward slash palapas uh actually let's just make it pv and then noobspero.com forward slash pv i'll link up their social media their website how do you get hold of them but um guys just quickly how can they get hold of you what's the best way i'd say shrek you want to get a hold of us just contact at palapas ventana.com Oh, or we've a, got a phone number if you prefer to go old school. It's plus one, three one zero, five nine four, dive. Awesome, awesome, guys. Had a magic time. Uh, you did not disappoint. I really want to come to Palapas Ventana and maybe someday in the future when this COVID BS goes away. Uh, not that it's BS. I'm I'm not saying that. Don't get all political with me if you're listening. All right, but when it's gone, hopefully we can all start traveling again. I'm looking forward to coming over there and going diving with you guys. Yeah, we are too. We really want to do the uh, the Shrek Noob Water University here, <laughs> and uh, we're we're pumped to host you guys. Yeah, tourism's coming back, and it's a, a safe part of the world to come. We've got all the COVID testing for when you go home, and uh, it's outdoor living, 
and we uh, are hip to all the protocols. So come on down and have some fun. Cool, guys. So if you're listening and you want to reach out and do a trip with Palapas Fintana, go to palapasfintana.com. Or if you are interested in doing one of these trips with me over there, maybe next year or maybe later in this year even, uh, yeah. just, just email me, Shrek at Noob Spirit, and I'll put you on a short list and we will see what we can come up with. So, um, but awesome, guys. Thanks, Brock. Thanks, Tim. Had a pleasure. All right. Thanks Thank a lot. you, Shrek. Hey guys, uh, I hope you enjoyed today's interview. The Palapas Fintana boys, I had an absolute ball with them. Um, it sounds like a fantastic place to go and, and en- enjoy an awesome spearfishing trip and a good time. If you're interested in possibly doing a trip with me when I finally get around to organising one when we're clear of all this rubbish, I'll be happy to hear it. Um, send me an email, shrek at noobspirit.com and I will put your name on a spreadsheet and we'll get I'll get together a bunch of names and we'll talk about putting together a trip and going over there and enjoying that together. So thanks for Tim Hatler and Brock Kennedy for enjoying uh, for joining me today and also for Jacob Knightley for helping to put that together. A uh, huge thank you. Next week, or in two weeks, with the bi-weekly fortnightly podcast, uh, Derek Tan. We talk seafood and the Goyo, t- I've called it seafood and Goyotaku, go- Goyo, Goyotaku renaissance. Uh, I still, I'm still butchering that word. I'm sorry to all the Japanese people that uh, listen, probably all five of you. Um, but anyway, hey, if you love the podcast, consider becoming a patron. I've got 48 patron legends at patreon.com forward slash new They support the podcast on an episode by episode basis. As usual, you're welcome to leave a review on podchaser.com forward slash new As usual, as well. Also, thank you for sharing the podcast with your mates, your friends, and tagging it on social media. Join us on Instagram. Brandon's running the Noob Spiro on Instagram there. Give us a shout out there as well. All good. Thanks for me. See you in two weeks. Derek Tan. Today's episode was an absolute banger, and so is our major sponsor, Adreno. Visit them at adreno.com.au. They have a huge range of equipment. You can find it at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear at checkout. When you shop online, you can save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can even use that code in-store at some of their huge mega stores Australia-wide. Price be guarantee on any Australian spearfishing equipment price. Again, visit them at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear. Neptonics was founded in 1996, making trigger mix in a barn in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Solid gear that works was their founding principle and it still rings true today in every pull of a Neptonics trigger, in every snap of a Neptonics band, and in every whiz of a Neptonics spear gun reel, singing with the power of another big fish. We had a great deal, you can use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off anything and everything at neptonics.com it's solid gear that works equipment you can rely on save 10 percent off any order at neptonics.com when you use the code noob10 manscaped is the best and below the waist grooming designed in fact for groin grooming no more awkward moments with pubes hanging out the side of your budgie smuggler Anyway, get 20% off and free shipping with the code NoobSpero. One word, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code NoobSpero. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. Your balls will thank you and so will the girls that have to look at you in a pair of budgie smugglers. <laughs>